Good morning. I want to welcome you not only to a Oasis Community Church, I want to welcome you to the month of August. Wow, it's hard to believe that we're here. Yes, it is a hot first day of August, and I think the heat index is already at 100. So what we need to do is to worship the Lord and be thankful that we have a building where we have air conditioning. Right, right. And so I have actually been in places where we didn't have that. I know uh, on different occasions I would be preaching in the Philippines, and uh, it would be outside, and it would be hot and muggy. And so uh, you make it happen, and the Lord blesses it. I kind of like the Lord to bless me inside with air conditioning. So uh, anyway, glad that you guys are here. We want to welcome everybody, particularly those of you who are guests. We're so glad that you're here today. And if you're a first-time guest, we want you to know that you're a very, very special treat to us. So let's show our appreciation to our guests. If you are here for the very first time today, we want to encourage you to uh, text the word welcome to the number that's on the screen. Uh, that uh, will send you a form and you'll just fill out a little bit of information. I think your uh, telephone number, your name and your email. And uh, we'll be getting you some information uh, from our church about what's happening here at Oasis. I think you'll get about one text a week for about six weeks and then it'll stop automatically. But if you would like to uh, have some questions answered that you that you don't see answered in the text, all you have to do is to call us. We'll be glad to answer those questions for you. But again, thank you so much for being here uh, today. Uh, one quick announcement, that is that uh, you've been faithful to uh, sign up for our children's ministry. Right now, Shannon is in the process of putting together a calendar for the months of August through December. And we're wanting to get every Sunday filled between now and then. Uh, it includes the opportunity to teach. It in includes the opportunity to help uh, the children with uh, crafts or help them with snacks. Now, that doesn't mean eat the snacks. It means provide the snacks. And the reason I know that is I ask, all right? Can I help eat the snacks? And I was told um. no. And so, uh, anyway, if you'll help with that, we really would appreciate it. Again, let me strongly, strongly impress upon the men in our fellowship. You have a moral obligation to help raise the children in the church. It's not the lady's job only. Can I get an amen? amen. I need to hear some baritone. Amen. All right, so go sign up. You're going to sign up at that desk over there on your way out today, okay? And so I know you're going to do it. I'm thankful for your faithfulness to serve. It is a very important ministry of our church. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. I want you to find four people today and say, welcome to the month of August. August. <laughs> August. Are you ready to worship with us this morning? Come on, we need y'all this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Step out of the shadows. Step out of the grave. Break into the wild. Don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces. Graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Graces waiting. Where the spirit.
Savior, I'm yours forever. 
Take a moment to bow your heads and open your hearts to the Lord today. The last few moments, it's been our desire to lead you to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. If he be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. When all men are brought to him, they kneel before him as Savior and Lord. They do that to the glory of the Father. What we do here on Sunday is so important. It prepares us for a week of ministry. It prepares us for a week of life. It prepares us for what lies ahead. My prayer for us today is that the Spirit of God would continue to move among us. That we would hear His Word. That we would obey. Father, we thank You today for... Jesus Christ apart from him we could not we could not in any way hope to be reconciled to you but because Jesus has come and lived a perfect life because he has died in our place because he was buried and on the third day rose from the dead we now have the hope of eternal life forgiveness of sins not hope in wishful thinking but of certain expectation. I know I have eternal life today. And I know that each person here who has confessed Jesus as Lord and has believed in their heart that you raised him from the dead has been imputed the gift of righteousness and stands complete before you. I pray, Father, that now they are filled with the Spirit of God that their lives would reflect that, that their worship would reflect that, that their home would reflect that, that every aspect of their life would respect their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you today for all we've celebrated. Be with us as we continue into your word. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated.
Today we begin a brand new series. Uh, we completed our series for the months of June and July, and I hope they were profitable and very um, applicable to your life. I know that what we're about to introduce is very, very important. It is uh, a topic that we don't discuss very, very often, but it is one that I'm confident that we need to be reminded of as, as often as we can. The sermon series uh, for the next several weeks is entitled, When the Enemy attacks when the enemy attacks our scripture for the series is going to be based out of the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and I'd like to take a few moments just to read through that as we introduce our series this morning Ephesians chapter 6 we want to begin in verse 10 the apostle Paul writes he says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The United States of America did not consider itself to be at war. Naively believing that the war in Europe as well as the war in Asia was not a matter of national security, and the Roosevelt administration sought to remain neutral except for providing some material assistance to Great Britain. The American people in Large numbers supported Roosevelt's decision by re-electing him to an unprecedented third term as President of the United States. In January 1940, 88% of the American population wanted to remain neutral. On November the 5th, 1940, Roosevelt was re-elected. Roosevelt said, quote, let no man or woman thoughtlessly or falsely 
talk of American people sending its armies to European fields. In March of 1941, President Roosevelt and the United States Congress passed what was known as the Lend-Lease Act to provide financial aid to Great Britain. And later, in that same year, August 1941, FDR met in person with Winston Churchill to form the Atlantic Charter, which included this statement, quote, that the U.S. would be compelled to take counteractive measures should Japan further encroach in the Southeast Pacific. On November the 26th, 1941, November 26th, 1941, the Japanese set sail for Pearl Harbor. Tragically, on a Sunday morning, in a little-known harbor at a U.S. naval base near Honolulu, Hawaii, was the scene of a horrific, devastating surprise attack. Just a few minutes before 8 a.m., specifically at 7.55 a.m. local time, the first wave of aerial attacks began. 183 Japanese warplanes dropped their deadly bombs on American naval vessels. Other planes bombarded U.S. airfields. And when the final waves were completed, the mission of the Japanese had managed to destroy or to damage nearly 20 American naval vessels, including eight battleships and over 300 airplanes. More than 2,400 Americans died in that attack. Not only sailors, but civilians. And another 1,000 people were wounded. December the 7th, 1941. The most memorable moments of this attack came at 8.10 a.m. that morning when a 1,800-pound bomb smashed through the deck of the USS Arizona. The ship exploded and sank, and that morning, before they woke up, 1,000 American men drowned inside the ship. The USS Arizona was never salvaged and it continues to be a resting place for 1,000 of America's best. President FDR addressed a joint session of Congress on December the 8th, the day after the crushing attack at Pearl Harbor. As millions of Americans either learned through reading newspapers or listened to the radio, the truth of what had happened the day before woke Americans up to realize that they were at war, that neutrality was not an option. By the end of World War II, the estimated cost adjusting for inflation in today's dollars, the war, World War II, would cost over $4 trillion. The defense spending for our nation comprised of about 40% of the GDP. Europe was realigned. And at the end, some 75 million people were casualties of war. Beloved, I do not want you to be deceived. You are at war. Every true believer that is described in the word of God, specifically in our letter to the Ephesians, found in Ephesians chapter 1 through chapter 3, those believers who live a faithful life as described in chapters 4 through 6 can be certain that he 
or she is involved in spiritual warfare. The faithful Christian life is a battle. It is a warfare on the grand scale. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Wherever God blesses, Satan begins to attack. If you and I are doing what Paul told the Ephesians to do in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 when he says, walk worthy of your calling. If you do that, that means that you're walking in humility rather than pride. It means that you strive for unity rather than divisiveness. It means that you choose to live in your new self rather than your old self. It means you choose to love rather than lust. It means you choose to walk in light rather than darkness. It means you choose to walk under the influence of the Holy Spirit rather than the influence of drunkenness. It means that you're willing to live in mutual submission rather than selfish independence. We can be absolutely certain when we do that, we will face opposition and conflict. As Christians, those who are serious to seek to grow in both the knowledge of and obedience to the Word of God will not find things getting easier. There's never a point when obeying God gets easy. There's never a moment you can call a ceasefire. Beloved, please listen to me. You have a real enemy. He does not want peace with you. His desire is to destroy everything you love. He comes, according to Jesus, to kill, steal, and destroy. Those aren't just words. Is this not some type of poetic uh, symbolism? You have a real enemy who hates you. He hates everything that you love. He is relentless. He is strategic. He has a very specific plan to wipe you out. Neutrality is not an option. We cannot make the same mistake in our own lives that the U.S. government made in the 1930s and the 1940s. Faithful living, preaching, teaching, giving, serving, loving, witnessing, being the right type of husband, the right type of wife, the right type of father, the right type of of mother, the right children, the right teenager, the right young adult, the right married, the right single, the right divorced, the right widowed, the right individual seeking to honor God will bring a special set of difficulties. Be prepared. A Christian that does not struggle with the flesh, the devil, or the world, is either living in sin or has slipped into complacency. I'm going to say it again. Write it down. A Christian that does not struggle with the flesh, the devil, and the world is either living in sin or has slipped into complacency. Yes, I can celebrate that we are called the sons and daughters of God. And yes, I can celebrate that we are called the servants of God. But I must remind you that we are also called to be the soldiers of Christ. Whenever the word of God, the work of God, and the will of God is put into action, God will bless it, Satan will attack it. 
wherever, whenever the word of God, the will of God, the work of God is put into action, God will bless it, Satan will attack it. At church, at home, at work, in Texarkana, in Bowie County, in Texas, in the United States, and throughout the world. Whenever the word of God, the will of God, and the work of God is put into action, God will bless it, Satan will attack it. You say, well, I just won't do anything. Really? The word of God says in the book of Galatians, let us bear one another's burdens. We all like that. But there's a verse about two verses down that says, let every man bear his own burden. What does he mean? Those are military terms. A burden, a military term. If you were in the U.S. military, if you were in the U.S. Marines, we, we have a young man that's in our fellowship, is in the U.S. Marines, and part of his responsibility when he goes out into the field, he has to carry his own burden. He has to carry his own rifle. He has to carry his own pack. No matter how heavy that pack is, he has a responsibility to take care of his own business. Now, yes, there may be times when he's wounded. And when he's wounded, what does a fellow soldier do? He picks him up, throws him on his back, and carries him to safety. But he's not supposed to carry it all of the time. Part of the problem in the church is you don't carry your own pack. You leave it to somebody else to carry your burden. I did it at another church for 13 years. If you didn't pick up the pack, I picked it up. And I carried mine, and I carried yours. It cost me my mind, it cost me my marriage, it cost me my ministry. I will not do it again. You say, boy, you're tough today. Grow up and get in the Lord's army. Okay? It's serious. Souls are at stake. Homes are at stake. What more, what more, what more do we have to see in our culture to get the church serious? How much more? Our children are going to school where they have to what? Be protected. There are cities in America. You can't walk down the street. Immorality is on display. And the church is asleep. You don't come here to see me do ministry. You come here to get inspired to go do the ministry. Churches have become a place where it's about entertainment. And we're entertaining ourselves to sleep while the world falls apart. And we naively believe that another election is going to solve our problem. America's problem is not a political problem. America's problem is not an economic problem. America's problem is a spiritual problem. And it's not going to change until we get on our knees and on our face before God and repent of the fact that we haven't taken it seriously. Let judgment begin at the house of God. It's a battle. Satan, we, we sang songs today about operating in freedom and operating in grace. Listen, God's provided it, but if you're going to maintain it, you've got to fight for it. You think for a minute Satan's going to let you live in the full uh, grace that God has provided for you? Do you think he's going to let you for a minute live into your potential and live into your destiny without a fight? He's not going to do it. Remember, wherever God blesses, Satan will attack. It's important for us to understand that as we begin this series. And here we are in the letter of the Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. 
but, but let me give you some context of the letter to the Ephesians. The church of Ephesians, or at Ephesus, the beginning of that is recorded in Acts chapter 19. When you have an opportunity today, go home and read Acts chapter 19. It tells you how it started. Paul, on his missionary journey, goes to this area of Asia. He's preaching the gospel. He goes into a synagogue, and he begins to preach there and to teach there. And there are Jews that are understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. There were 12 disciples of John the Baptist who were lost. They hadn't understood that Jesus had come, that Jesus of Nazareth really was the Messiah, and he shares Christ with them. And what? They're saved, and they receive the Holy Spirit. They manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are water baptized, and they are what? Put into action, and the church at Ephesus begins, and there are more people that are coming to Christ. But where God bless Satan attacks, the Jews in the synagogue at Ephesus said, Get out. Get out. Don't teach this anymore. You're not allowed back. There happened to be a private school in Ephesus. And Paul got rights to go to that school. And from 12 noon, no, 11, 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. every day, he taught in that school. He reasoned among the Jews who would come and the Greeks about Jesus. And there were people being saved by the hundreds. But where God blesses, Satan attacks. As you read Acts chapter 19, it says that there were a group of men who made silver statues of a goddess. And now because people were coming to Christ, people weren't interested in buying the statues anymore. Because they were now worshiping the one true God. And they got mad because why? They're not making money anymore. Where God blesses, Satan attacks. It says that they took some of the followers of Jesus of the way. They drugged them into what? A public coliseum. And for two hours they chanted the name of the goddess. And threaten to kill the followers of Christ. And had not a city magistrate come in and told them, if you do this, Rome will be on us and will suffer the consequences. Let them go. Where God blesses Satan attacks I suggest to you that the church at Ephesus was one of the most powerful churches in the first century they were doctrinally fed Paul stayed there almost three years teaching them about who they were in Christ you want to know who you are in Christ read Ephesians chapter 1 through chapter 3 It is loaded with a lifetime of study to know who you are in Christ. And for three years, he taught them, even in the midst of persecution. This church became an evangelistic, I mean, mission point, launching into Asia like we little understand. Do you understand that the first church in that part of the world was Ephesus? And do you realize that the seven churches of Asia that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and chapter 3 were born out of the evangelistic, mission-minded church at Ephesus? When you read about Sardis and Laodicea and Thyatira and Philadelphia, the seven churches of Asia, six of those churches, excluding Ephesus, Ephesus was born out of the mission work and and evangelistic work of that church.
My challenge to us today is, why can't we be that kind of church? God didn't start Oasis Church to give me a place to preach. Let that sink in. It's not about me. I may be your pastor today. I may not be your pastor next Sunday. It's not about me. You are Oasis Community Church. You have been called by God to make a difference in this community and beyond, regardless of the pastor. Am I proud to be your pastor? Absolutely. But this mission, this ministry, this evangelistic lighthouse is here whether I'm here or not. And it doesn't need to start next week, next month, next year. We need to take it seriously today. Now, Here's my point. We begin to take it seriously, get ready, because where God blesses, Satan attacks. And God's going to show you ways to deal with your individual weaknesses and areas of temptation. He's doing the same thing for me. He shows me areas of weakness. He shows me areas of temptation. He equips me to be able to handle that. But here's the thing you got to remember. If he doesn't attack you this way, he'll attack you that way. My warning to you as a man in your family is cover your family. If you don't already know and you haven't already experienced it, he's coming for your family. He's coming for your wife. He's coming for your kids. If you're a single mom, he's coming for your kids. If you're a single dad, He's coming for your kids. If you're a single granddad, grandmom, he's coming for your grandkids. He wants your kids wrapped up in all types of stuff as early as he can get them. He wants them confused about what? Their gender, their sexual orientation. He wants them confused about drugs and alcohol. He wants them confused about who they are in Christ. Of course, the greatest thing he can do is keep them away from Christ. Let them live their life and die and go to hell. And I'm fixing fixing to hurt some feelings right here. Some of you are more important, you're more concerned about getting your kids to social and athletic competition than getting them into the word of God and your kids are lost and they're going to go to hell. Well, I don't like that. Well, you just got the truth. Listen to me. I'm 54 years old. That window that you have to impress upon your children the importance of Christ is smaller than you think. You say, well, I got them until they're 18. They stop listening at 12. I can tell people have never had teenagers. If you think they're going to listen to you until they're 18, you ain't raised a teenager. They start tuning you out about eight years old. Their friends are more persuasive. TV and movies and music are more persuasive. Unless you do what? Step in and get spiritual authority and influence your kids. He's coming. Say, he's coming. Some of you, he's already doing it. A bold Christian is an effective Christian. An effective Christian is a persecuted Christian. A 
bold Christian is an effective Christian. An effective Christian is a persecuted Christian. But a persecuted Christian who stands in the faith is a victorious Christian. I'm not telling you to cower. Listen to me. You, you, you and I, we, we, we can't do anything but fight. When the Japanese came to Pearl Harbor, negotiations were off. We had been negotiating since 1938 with the Japanese, foolishly believing we were making progress. You say, well, how do we do that spiritually? We pray just enough, read just enough of the Bible, go to church just enough to believe we're okay. Not realizing that unless you're really in, you're fixing to get hit. And hit unprepared. Walking out the door and saying, God bless my day is not being a prayer warrior. Trying to find your Bible on Saturday night to bring it to church isn't getting prepared for battle. Coming once every three or four weeks to church isn't getting prepared for battle. Leaving the ministry to everybody else is not getting prepared for battle. Carry your own pack. Put back on that screen, Ephesians 6.10. I'm going to come back to it. In the book of Acts, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you don't get it, you can watch it again or come to me and I'll give you the notes. In the book of Acts... Whenever the move of God began to take place in Jerusalem, organized religion sought to crush it. When it began to flourish under persecution in Damascus, Judaism tried to crush it. When it began to expand and both Greeks and Jews were coming to Christ, Gentiles and Jews were coming to Christ in the city of Antioch, prejudice and envy began to attack. In Philippi, sorcery attacked. In Thessalonica, hedonism, pleasure-seeking <clears throat> began to attack. Did you hear what I said? <clears throat> Let me have a bottle of water. <clears throat> Ephesians, the devil ain't going to stop me. <clears throat> I'll preach to empty chairs. You ain't stopping me, liar. We all get fired up and say sorcery attack Philippi. What a terrible thing. Worshiping the devil. What a terrible thing. In Thessalonica, it was pleasure seeking. Entertainment. Hedonism. Life ain't about having fun all the time. It's about building the kingdom of God. You're not here to have fun all the time. Sure, have fun. But your life's not built around having fun. In Corinth, it was skepticism. In Ephesus, it was materialism. Any of this sound like America? Any of this sound like Texarkana? Any of this sound familiar to Oasis? Hello. Paul had been there three years teaching the word of God. The Bible says in Acts 19, 17 through 20, listen to this. It became known to all who lived in Ephesus, both Jew and Greeks. The name of Jesus was magnified and exalted. Did you hear me? Let's read that again. It became known to all who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. The name of Jesus was magnified and exalted. Many of those who had become believers were coming 
So the word of the Lord was growing greatly and prevailed. God was blessing. What's coming? Help me, what's coming? When God blesses, the devil attacks. That's, that's Acts 19, 17 through 20. Let me read Acts 19, 23 and 28. Remember it ended with this. The word of the Lord was growing greatly and prevailing. The name of Jesus was magnified and exalted. God was blessing. Two verses later. About that time. Say that with me. About that time. About what time? About the time the name of Jesus was magnified and exalted. About the time Jews and Gentiles were coming to Christ. About the time that the word of the Lord was growing greatly and was prevailing. About that time. There occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. What way? Jesus. And the people were filled with rage. Listen to me. Satan will use me. Satan will use you. Satan will use other pastors. And I'll say this. It's none of your business if I'm pastoring today. There are pastors who want to make it their business to tell other people whether I'm qualified to pastor or not. It ain't none of your business. That's between me and the Lord. All right? And all you're doing is trying to hinder. All right? Not only other pastors can get in the way, other churches can get in the way. Other believers can get in the way. Your family can get in the way. Anybody got family that tries to get in the way? Come on, let's have a little church right now. Am I talking to live or dead folks? Anybody got family that tries to get in the way? You go to that church too much. You pray too much. You read your Bible too much. You talk about Jesus too much. Anybody got family like that? I do. I do. Friends. Friends will get in the way. Anybody got friends that will get in the way? They always got something to do on Sunday. Why don't you come with me on Sunday? Why don't you come do this? Why don't you come do that? Can I tell you something? You're going to have to stand up. You haven't got any business at Fat Jack's and Whiskey River on Saturday and coming to church on Sunday. That ain't nothing but a devil's den, and the devil's going to take advantage of you. Well, it ain't no problem. I can handle it. You're deceived. If you lie with the dogs, you're going to get the fleas. I'm telling you, stay away. Stay away. You haven't got any business there. Satan will use family, he'll use friends, he'll use deacons, he'll use board members, he'll use worship leaders. What I'm telling you is, don't let the devil use you. We got a business to do, and that is to preach the gospel. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to end. I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to let you go. Finally, my brethren, this is our theme verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong. The Christian life is not for the weak. Be strong in the Lord. Why? Because you ain't got what it takes on your own. And in the power of his might. Same words that are used in Ephesians chapter 1 that says that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. The same power that raised him from the dead is the same power that will allow you to Stand. You're not taking my family. Stand. I lost my family, but I got another family. I'm standing. And I'm warning you. Stand. 
He wants to destroy this church. Stand. He wants to take Texarkana to hell. Stand. He wants to disregard the name of Jesus. The name above all names. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus is Lord. Take your stand in the power of the Lord. One hour before the attack on Pearl Harbor. One hour before 24 Hundred Americans lost their life. One hour. The sailors on the USS Ward were patrolling the waters outside of Pearl Harbor. They did it daily. They spotted and sank a two-man Japanese submarine that had weapons with the intention of entering the harbor to sink U.S. warships. When they reported this, their message was disregarded, and in less than 60 minutes later, all hell broke loose. It was not until a couple of years ago that because of technology, the two-man sub was actually found, and we were able to verify the report of the sailors on the USS Ward, but it was too late. My final words to you in my message today, I'm warning you. I told Shannon that I wrestled all week with the Lord about this series. Not because I was afraid of it. Just wanted to do something different. And every time I would pursue a direction, I got brought back here. Every time I'd pursue another direction, I got brought back here. Every time I pursued another direction, I got brought here. Normally, I have some idea in advance of where I'm going to head. I knew in March that my June and July sermons we're going to be about eight laws of the jungle, lessons that you don't have to learn the hard way. I knew that. But I was never getting any clarification for the next series. So I'm ending the last series sermon last week. I'm still unclear. And when I begin to get some clarity, I'm arguing. I'm telling you this because I've seen God through his word prepare us before. In the fall of, in winter, in the fall and winter, for those of you who are here on Wednesday night, the fall and winter, 2019 and early 2020, we had been studying the book of Revelation. We, we were studying about wars and rumors of wars. We were studying about pestilence and disease. In March, the world shuts down because of a pestilence and disease. Are, are you hearing me? God was speaking to us to prepare us for what was coming. Today, we're in a series about spiritual warfare. I submit to you that God is preparing us for what's coming. What's coming, preacher? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you what it is. But I know that God is saying, be on high alert, be prepared. The devil's coming in earnest to destroy. 
Me? I don't know. You? I don't know. The church? I don't know. Texarkana? I don't know. America? I don't know. But I know that God's people are being called to be prepared. And you say, well, what are they preaching at First Baptist? Don't know, don't care. What are they preaching at Heritage? Don't know, don't care. Why? It's not my business. This is the flock I pastor, and I'm telling you, get ready. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love your families. I love your kids. I love your grandkids. I love this church. I love this community. It's why I'm here. And all I can do is, is plead with you. As the man of God. Who stands before you. Be prepared. Be prepared. And over the next several weeks. I'm going to do everything I can. To teach you how to be prepared. I'm going to tell you about the armor. And it's great. I'm going to tell you how to put it on. I mean, I mean it's, it, that armor is more real than this chair. You say, I can't see it, but it's real. And, and I know it's real because God said it's real. It's more real than this. You say, how can you say that? This is passing away. But the word of God never passes away. And what I'm telling you is be prepared. I'm not telling you to be prepared in, in a whimpering, defeated mentality, but put on the full armor of God that you'll be able to stand. And once you get your standing, do what? Then beat him back. Beat him back. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The word prevail doesn't mean that the gates of hell are on the offensive. It means that when we do what we do, they're on the defensive. It's time for the church to go on offense. Because he can't. Yes, sir. Show him the hill. My favorite part in the movie, The Passion. Remember that? We are the generation that I believe will see the return of the Lord. I read on Facebook the other day, or yesterday, somebody had put on there and says, you know, I believe we're living in the tribulation. We're not. We're not. It's coming. And it's coming to a theater near you. Okay? It, 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 it's not here. But do not be deceived, my dearly beloved. You see, I I believe in a pre-trib rapture. I believe we're out before the tribulation begins. And the reason is, without going into a whole other sermon, the reason is, is that the 70th week of Daniel is about the Jewish people, not the church. But listen to me, it doesn't mean that it won't get dark before it happens. We believed in pre-trib because we think we're going to get out of trouble. Listen, if the church is doing what it's supposed to do, it can't help but get in trouble with the world. The world hates us. The world hate, The world's in opposition to us. Hey, listen to me. The world doesn't care as long as we come in here. They, they don't care what we do in here. They don't. The mall doesn't care what we do in here. I promise you, right? We, we write checks. Right? We, we pay rent every month. They don't care. If we started having goat roping in here on Sunday, they wouldn't care as long as they get that check. All right? But you start going out those doors and start living the Christian life. You start manifesting the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do it at work. How many school teachers we got? Start, start something up there and see what happens. Go to a football game this fall. We, are we going to have prayer at a football game? Talk to me. We having prayers at football games? No, what are we doing? We getting on the loudspeaker and saying stand for what? A moment of reflection. 
stand up and say, let's all reflect on Jesus. You, you got high school kids playing football. They don't need no reflection. They need to pray they don't break each other's neck. It's your country you can't pray in. It's your school district you can't pray in. It's the place you pay taxes that you can't pray in. When are we going to wake up, church? Well, they won't like us. I didn't know that was part of the deal. What, what did Jesus say? Every day, more and more liberties are being taken away from the church. And what do we do? Oh, I'm, fix, oh, I'm fixing to get really, really, I'm fixing to get real, real personal. What do we do? We, we couldn't get in any church in this town. We couldn't get 10 people to come to a prayer meeting to pray for revival in America, but bring in the latest comedian. I ain't apologizing. Bring in the latest comedian. Oh, it's a Christian comedian. Okay, let's laugh while the, while the world dies and goes to hell. Let's bring in the latest what? Band. We'll pack it out. And then we have the nerve to talk about how we love Jesus, but we'll let our neighbor die and go to hell and never tell them about Jesus. You say, boy, I tell you what, I bet you don't have a job after today. I tell you what, I can push buggies at Walmart. Listen to me. I'm going to end with this. I keep telling you I'm going to end. I'm like Paul, finally brethren. <laughs> I spent 27 years trying to please people to build a church. And when God brought me out of my sin... And brought me back to repentance. I promised him I'd never do it again. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you get prepared. What you do with it is your business. But as for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. As our musicians prepare for an invitation today. Please, please, please take me serious. I don't, I don't know what's ahead, but I'm telling you, God's telling us, get prepared. I don't, I don't know. I rejoice in the fact that I can tell you a number of times in the short history of this church that God has spoken to some of you. He has spoken to me to tell us Maybe not in detail, but to prepare us for what's coming. And I'm thankful for that. And I want us prepared. I don't want you to stand. I want you to stay seated. I want you comfortable. I want the lights turned down. I want them to sing. You can come to the front and kneel. You can stay seated where you're at. You can stand. You can lay prost uh, prostrate, on, prostrate on the ground. You can do whatever you feel led to do. But I'm telling you, get on your face. Lift your hands to heaven. Get before your God today. He's got something to say. And I am specifically talking to the men of this church. You are called not only to be a provider, but a protector. And that's just not with a 38 or a nine millimeter in your house it's on your knees before God if you will sing for us spirit of God come and move in this place one. 
pray over you. So early in our life, Satan seeks to get a foothold. He seeks to wound us and hurt us. And I know that some of you who come, you know, you struggle with things from your past. Not that you necessarily have done anything wrong. You just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time where people made bad decisions and you got wounded. Satan wants to use that. Others of you, he brings about insecurities and depression. I want you to know today that God's a bondage breaker. What I, what I want to encourage you to do is to be still before the Lord. Now, I know what's going to happen. Satan's going to have a thousand thoughts running through your head. The phone's going to ring. Doorbell's going to ring. Kids are going to ask for your attention. Dog wants to go outside, right? Just hush. Just be still. God who spoke to Moses through the bush the God who walked with the three Hebrew children in the fire the God who walked on the water the God who broke the bread and the fish and multiplied it and blessed people is your God you're special to him you're his child got to learn how to discern the spirits try the spirits to see if they're of God if you hear voices of condemnation it's not from your God if, if you hear voices of guilt and shame it's not from your God If it's voices that bring up your past, it's not your God. If it's a voice that brings up fear about the future, it's not your God. My sheep know my voice. Join hands with the person beside you, whether you know them or not. I want to pray over you today. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, a resurrected, glorified Savior who sits in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father, who lives to intercede for us. He does not intercede for our sins, for our sins have been forgiven, but he intercedes on behalf of our weaknesses. He knows that we are but flesh. As a result, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy, help in time of need. We exalt him, we worship him, we glorify you, God, as our father. We declare today that Satan is a defeated foe. He is already defeated. We declare that we will see that in our own lives, in our church, in our community. He was defeated 2,000 years ago at the cross. What he thought was the end of the work of God was only the beginning. Jesus died for our sins, all of them past, present, and future. And not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And we have been reconciled to you, and now we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors to announce that sin has been paid for in the person of Jesus Christ. And we know that because he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead, triumphant and victorious, and he sits in glory, soon to return for his own. But in the meantime, in the meantime, 
we will stand firm. We declare we will take back everything he has stolen. Legally, he has to yield it back to us because you, Lord, are the true owner and you have given it to us as your children. Protect our families, protect our church, protect our community. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is hate, bring love. Where there is prejudice and bitterness, bring forgiveness. Where there is disease, bring healing. Where there is lack, bring abundance. And we ask this as the children of the King of Kings, not as beggars, but as your children. We ask this for the glory of the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, His Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. great message. God is good. Don't forget to sign up as a volunteer for our children's ministry. Desk right over here on this side. And don't forget refuel on Wednesday evening. Hey, I got something to tell you. I'm sorry. We got some people who came to join the church. All right, come on up here real quick. I want to apologize. My mind's going a thousand miles an hour. Would you introduce your family to me and to the church again? I'm Dwayne Dye, and this is my wife, Jody. Okay. I knew they were the Dyes. I couldn't remember the first name. I used to go to school, high school, with a girl named Dye. Her name was Lisa. So I remember the name Dye, plus can't forget with the tie-dye shirt. And so that helps. You gave me a clue, but I couldn't remember. These are some wonderful folks. They're going to be coming to us on the promise of a letter from another church in our community. They want to be a part of what God is doing here. I know that you affirm that, but would you do it with an amen? Amen. All right, good deal. They're going to come out here with Shannon and I. You can introduce yourself, give them a hug, and you can finish your announcements. All right, come on. There we go. All right, it's a wonderful day. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that we got to worship together. And uh, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.